All right. Hello, everybody. Happy Friday. Welcome to Art for Art's Sake from the St. Lawrence County Arts Council. My name is Maggie McKenna. I'm the director of the St. Lawrence County Arts Council, and I'm happy to present my friend William to join us and show us some of his writing and um, talk about his creative process and inspiration. It's going to be a really fun event. Um, I want to thank all of the artists who have participated already and those who are going to be par participating in the coming weeks. It's really been fun to, to meet more of our local artists or formerly lo local artists in some cases um, and, and share the art that we have in our community with, with our greater community. If you're an artist of any discipline, reach out to me if you'd like to be a part of this, if you'd like to get on our schedule and we'll find a date to, to set you up. Um, you can email me at director at slcartscouncil.org or you can just message us here on Facebook and I'll get in touch with you that way. Um, also, we want to thank all of our sponsors, our previous sponsors for this event. Um, you're helping us keep the arts going in our North Country region and, and keeping our community connected to our local artists. So we very much appreciate you as well. If you're interested in sponsoring this program in the future, you can also email me. Um, if you also just want to help continue to support the local arts, you can donate. You can make a donation right now. Just go to slcartscouncil.org slash give and you can make a donation. Um, I'm, as I said, I'm very excited to show you William Eckert and all of the awesome work that he's been doing. He said he's a reporter and I know him from that, but he's really an incredible artist too. So he said, oh, I don't know if anybody knows my artwork, so let's share it. So, well, without further ado, further ado here's <laughs> William Eckert. <laughs> Thanks, Max. How's it going? Uh, so, uh, yeah, so I've, uh, I've been here for seven years and haven't really done a lot in the um, in the art world here. Um, really, it was, I think it was like last year was the first thing that I started doing stuff with like related to arts. Um, they had a uh, Centennial Chautauqua in Canton. Um, a lot of artists were invited to do stuff and come out and, uh, you know, Sean O'Brien who put it on. Uh, I had known personally, he knew I did some poetry stuff and we were trying to work something out. Uh, and he asked me to get involved in that. Um, I guess a couple of days before I'd met uh, a local uh, experimental duo, Claude and Ola Aldis, who do fantastic stuff that I didn't even know existed around here. And, uh, you know, and I was actually through my capacity as a reporter that I met them and got to talk to them and let them know what I was doing and uh, asked them if they would come up and perform with me. And it was like two days from the point we met. I had a bunch of stuff that I had written uh, and they just showed up and it was complete and total improvision on the stage. And um, I think the idea of you know, the, like we think about like art and like the boundaries of art and kind of like, you know, poetry should be done a certain way or, you know, music is done a certain way. Uh, the thing that I loved about the relationship that, you know, we forged doing that kind of thing is that I went up with an idea that I was going to read with music behind me. Uh, and it turned into a complete performance where we just fed off of each other. Uh, if I, if, you know, Ola was doing something on piano and was building up, uh, I started like, you know, raising my voice uh, I had a megaphone to get even louder at points. We were screaming and it was just complete chaos and then it came back down and it was just working off each other uh, and having that kind of relationship that uh, I think is uh, a fantastic metaphor for what, well, A, what, you, what you're doing, Maggie, and kind of like in the community and trying to foster this whole uh, artist's community and getting people together and working together and, and, and uh, showcasing people's work, people who may have never been heard of before around here in this capacity, such as myself, uh, you know, worked on smaller keys. And, and so I'm trying to do that a little bit with pulling musicians together and trying to come up with this sort of like a, uh, I guess a sort of a scene of like experimenting with uh, what we know as the boundaries of art and what we are supposed to consider acceptable or not acceptable or whatever the case that, you know, may be and kind of uh, break that. And, uh, you know, we are, I, we talked about this earlier, we are living now in a time of nothing but experimentation, right? I mean, you know, even on like a, a level of the state creating boundaries as to what we can or can't do. I mean, it's all a guessing game. You know, when can we go out? When can we, you know, have physical contact with the people that we care about, for, you know, and, and that kind of thing. So, I mean, really it's while we're all locked up, what you're doing with this uh, and I think artists and the arts in general, I mean, 
if we are allowed outside again and uh, and go back to school and we start looking at budgets and you know as a reporter you see these things in your report autumn if anybody ever talks about cutting the arts i mean if there's ever been a time and proof that like the arts have been like more important than they've ever been it's been now i mean this is something that uh, hands down people have been looking at and relying on uh, whether they're doing it here on a local level or whether they're turning on their tv and watching reruns of uh, you know, parks and rec or community. I mean, it's all the arts. It all started somewhere. And I, I think that, you know, hopefully this will be the beginning of showing uh, if for those that didn't already appreciate it, the value of what we have here. Uh, and so thank you, Maggie, for that. Uh, thank, thank you. you for, for thank you for saying that on the record. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, us. I mean, on your record, I'm not on the job right now, you know. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> on my record, yeah. But, uh, but so, yeah, I am. Um, so I sifted through my stuff. I, you know, come from anybody that knows me knows like, I, I come from a family of storytellers. I got the Irish American father and the Italian American mother, two people who should not have had children. I mean, we're all wonderful, but we just don't stop talking. So, you know, there needs to be somewhere along the way. Um, a level of, of, of guidance, right? So I had gone through a bunch of stuff. I have some new stuff that has been inspired um, by new people that I've met uh, and have been in my life uh, by the situations that we're under right now. Uh, I have some older stuff that I was looking at. There were some things that I was like questioning, you know, I had been uh, for a long time had gone through a lot of crazy stuff. And a lot of my work was uh, in the seemingly sense the writing was almost violent in some ways without, you know, being uh, vulgar you know, artistically showing that there were some darker sides to that as a teenager, you know, everybody has that angst kind of thing. So there was a lot of that. Um, but I'm going to read some of the, the, the older stuff first. And uh, a lot of these things came from uh, anybody who's never really done poetry or has or never really thought about writing it and worries about influence because influence is important because we're all inspired by something one way or another. Um, I had worked with somebody who gave us, it was almost like a workshop. They give you different ideas where to uh, get things from. Uh, there was a, um, imitation poems, trans, uh, translitic poems and things like that. Um, this, I'm gonna read one that was referred to as a, um, a junk drawer poem. Uh, and this was, we were told, take a, um, everybody has a junk drawer in their house. And uh, if you open it up, you're gonna find the things that you didn't know you still had, you know, from like 10 years ago, uh, things that you don't know where they came from. It's the mystery drawer. Um, at the time, uh, I was listening to a lot of Tom Waits. I, frankly, I still listen to a lot of Tom Waits. Um, so we used to, in Albany where I was living at the time, used to go out and we used to go to bars and we had poetry reading nights. So we had nights where the bars were dedicated just to that with musicians that were there. Uh, and so we had a night where, uh, you know, we went out and I performed it in a very Tom Waitsy kind of thing. Um, yeah, that. Uh, and uh, had a sax player and an upright bassist. And this goes back to the whole having like a collaboration of music and words. So I'm gonna read this piece. It's the junk drawer poem. It's called Bound and the Stuff That Takes Up Space. Here it is, Jack. I've cleared the place out and finally found a use for all that stuff that takes up space. You see, I followed her trail of muddy footprints February's given her. Yeah, she's bound to be cornered. I know this place better than she, bound to be bound by that stuff that takes up space. That taut phone wire cut and burn Alice loves to encounter the night she invaded this place with invitation in hand. Bound by wrists and ankles tied, the blood begins to trickle, a dry sponge to soak it up. How useful is this stuff that takes up space? Man, Jack, the shock on Alice's face when her tongue validates these useful batteries before she was gifted with my super glue chapstick. So you see, Jack, I'm safe now from her as she smiles and her discovering my terror in the dark for I possess a nightlight amongst this stuff that takes up space. And when we did it, it was in a Tom Waits voice. Like I said, it's, it's kind of dark and it did <laughs> really dark, right? But the idea was I, the first thing I pulled out was this nightlight. And I'm going like, I don't know why we own one of these things. 
And then thinking like somebody who's afraid of the dark, you know, as a kid, people think like, oh, you're afraid of the dark and they find it a joke. And it's like, here's somebody who comes into your, your space and finds out your deep, dark secret. And you want to do everything you can to keep them quiet. And so it just started unraveling as we went from there. Dark, probably one of the darker pieces I've ever written. Um, I wrote it in, I think, 2003, 2004, I think. So it's, it's been around for a little while. Um, you know, and some of these pieces also, uh, when I was writing them, we're doing it sort of like more artistic, sort of like thinking about the format and how it's written. So, you know, I'll show you like the piece I'm going to read now is called, is, uh, called Stingy. You can see that it's from the format of it, it's broken up. There's a lot of ellipses. So I would like to see the, it, I want it to be pleasant to the eye as well because I'm looking at it as I'm reading it. Um, I think that plays a big part. So uh, this piece, Stingy. The bones of my reckless virus glides back, both held high and level. This complete security against the harassment of culture whores, their judgment taken me from sleep. The doors left open, where is my detector? Have I lost transmission? Now there is a, being a translytic, uh, because I've written this so long ago, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I like, I, but it's, you know, now reading it and seeing it and like anything else, um, actually I'll read something that I wrote uh, the other day. I went for a walk in Ives Park. Um, I was talking with somebody about the, um, the strangeness that like, you know, where for those of us that live alone, you know, you don't have contact with people. Right? And you're not supposed to have physical contact with people. Um, all my immediate relatives live out of the area. Um, you know, so I haven't, I think the last time I've touched a person might have been like in March. You know, I'm mean, like, it just feels like it's, it's all right, happens, I suppose, right? It's for everybody's safety. Um, so um, this is somebody who I met during the pandemic, who like I've become like quite friendly with. And, you know, we have never had any sense of physical contact. And, you know, as being told, it's like, oh, so she brushed against somebody and said, like, I touched this person's hand and went into like a state of like, oh, like, is this okay? Or you were not supposed to be touching people, right? So, um, you know, part of, I was thinking about that, the idea of touch and, you know, um, and, and, you know, when it's, you know, when it happens for those of us that maybe don't live with people and haven't had it, how strange will that sensation be? to have physical contact with another person, shaking hands or what it feels like to hug somebody again or, uh, or anything of that nature. Um, so this is not titled, uh, like I said, I wrote this just uh, the other day and just sat down and put it together. <clears throat> Spring, so cold, can't touch, unforgiving. Walking, waking up from this place. We made, not ours, a bench, not for sitting, eyes closed, birds sing, in my heart, in my ears, wind is whipping. Sun down on my face, through closed eyes, feel it burning, lay back, steer clear of my cat. <laughs> lay back, steer clear of your touch, familiar, foreign. Can I, just now, have your voice bring me peace? The idea that, um, you know, we have these back and forths and that we can see each other and speak to each other and have these, these relationships, but still at such a distance is just such a, like I said, a really foreign, really strange thing. Um, you know, the idea of being inspired by, like I was just going for a walk in the park just to be outside. And, you know, there are people just wandering around a little bit at a time. Uh, and it, of course at distances, if someone's walking along the path while I'm sitting in the bench, sitting back with my eyes closed and listening and feeling this, you know, these things. Uh, you know, I didn't go to write, but it just strikes you. And I just, I figured uh, there's an Alan Watts, um, lecture that he had given and he was talking about sound uh, in meditation. And so that when you meditate, people think that you're supposed to clear your mind completely. 
and not think of anything and everything has to be still and quiet and all of that. Good luck. Uh, you know, the, the, the truth is, um, if you're willing to open yourself to all of the sounds that are going to happen that you have no control over, um, and the things that are going to be going on in your head with no control over that, uh, you know, I think of the writing, uh, and, you know, I sang for a band for a number of years. I mean, so like, even that, like I was all experimenting with what I was doing with my voice, uh, things that I was doing with my words, uh, because there's really no right way to do it. I mean, any way you do it is the way you do it. I mean, it's not wrong. I mean, I remember an instructor telling me once there's, um, you know, if you write something and you call it a poem, it's a poem. It might not be very good, but it's a poem like Love is a Rose is not going to be probably the best poem. But if you start talking about why and breaking it down and putting thought into it, I think that the whole point of all of this is if you do something experimental, whether it's, um, you know, screaming into a microphone over somebody just chugging away at a guitar and it emits some kind of reaction from somebody. I think that the art in and of itself has done its job. It's job. You know, I think, I think that, you know, I wonder if, if this all kind of feels like it's um, more about being in the moment, right? Being present in the moment. You just yeah. said meditation and you're talking about experimentation. Really all of that with your, um, perhaps your inspiration is, is related to just being present in the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it took a long time to get there. I mean, <laughs> I was, right. and, you know, I left, like I said, even before I was willing, you know, like, so like, let me think about how I'm going to do this, because, you know, I am an absolute scatterbrain, like my head is everywhere. And sometimes it is a matter of just taking that breath. And, uh, you know, I was telling, you know, several of my friends, like, I was, you know, I'm going to be, I hope I'm reading slowly enough, you know, I'm a Staten Islander, like I said, who lives in a family of, you have to talk fast. Because if you don't talk fast or cut in, you're never going to get a chance to talk because everybody else is talking so damn much, you know. So that was kind of where I came from, and I love that. I mean, like, there's it was never, um, you know, but it, it it really gets you kind of to a point where you're just moving. Everything moves very quickly, right? Um, and I'm sure time is going to be moving quickly. I don't want to keep, uh, you know, but you know, the I aside from the poetry I've done, I'm working on a couple of different. Um, I dare not say like novels or books because I'm just writing it as it happens. Um, I write, uh, like if I have an idea for a story in my head, I don't sit down and do an outline. I just kind of write in like fragments, like puzzle pieces. So I have an idea for a character and I know where he wants to go and I have ideas about it. I'll write down a piece, might be a couple of paragraphs, might be three pages. And then I, you know, if I dry up, I walk away from it. And then if something else, and then I start taking segues to piece them together. How is the story going to work? Um, so I have a, char a character by the name of uh, Larry or Lawrence, uh, who his story, which is far too much to get into that I'm not going to do it here. But I will tell you that um, in his story, you know, there are times where I have had um, an idea for a story and have failed to write it down. And then I've kicked myself later when I forgot what it was. Right. <laughs> so uh, I was driving to Albany. Uh, it was in December. Uh, it was, you know, through the Adirondacks in a, in a snowstorm of some kind uh, or just after. And so everything was quiet. It was the middle of the night. I was driving along uh, and I do tend to carry books with me to write in or whatever the case may be. And I had just maybe two or three words stuck in my head. This character is, um, you know, in a place where he is well, well, well into the future. Like, beyond where we like you know thousands of years into the future this he's some he has um, become host to something that has allowed him to survive uh points of where he's like maybe one of the few remaining on, on the planet that he lives maybe it's this planet you know we're still working it out um but trying to think about all the things that he was uh all the things that he came to understand through um you know where he was uh and the couple of the words that got stuck in my head were thinking about uh, he's so old that under his fingernails are the dirt and bloods of the beginning of time kind of thing. Like he's been there for that long, that it's still there. Uh, and so I pulled over and I just started to take a couple of notes and it turned into about, oh, three pages. It's not three pages here, but um, I'd like to read this, uh, you know, and, and, and figured kind of just a, it's sort of a little bit about who he is and where he is and, and where it leaves you off wondering as to maybe where he's going to go or what's going to happen next. So um, this is a passage from this story that I'm, the working title is called The Carriers. 
Lawrence gazed through the splintered frame of, four, of the four-paned window, through the tree line beyond it, past the mountains and the valley beyond that. Larry gazed through with the smell of infinity clinging to his beard, a beard that grew as long as the smell embedded in it was old. Lawrence, with his locks cloaking all but his eyes, which gazed through infinity, his ancient healing hands still in his lap. Lawrence was infinity. He was Israel and Palestine, Kronos and his consumed children, the blood and dirt of the beginning lodged under his fingernails. A fire crackled nearby. Like a snow-covered Minerva at midnight in December, Lawrence sat at peace, silent, rugged, beautiful. Fragments of his life, like meteors entering the atmosphere, burned up as quickly as they arrived. All that remains is time. And while he remains still in his chair, watching sunset after sunset, his mind jumps through time and space until they arrive. The collectors of that which Lawrence is host, of that which is as old as existence itself, of that which the collectors, like sacred druids, exist only to rend the element from its host, which has outlasted its usefulness, but forgets to let go. As Lawrence rises up from his place at the window, he takes his gaze away from infinity and stirs the dying fire. And like infinity, he can see they have arrived. I haven't decided where I wanna put that. I thought about making that the prologue and then making people just go into his backstory. Um, I do have actually, because we're talking about this, I do wanna read the prologue that I have for it now, which writes more like poetry than it does um, prose. Uh, and it's a short piece. I did an interview with um, a friend of mine, well, someone who became a friend of mine through work. Uh, he lives um, in uh, on Wolf Island, usually, and he's usually over, on Can over the Canadian side, over in Kingston. Um, and he had been in Italy for a number of years. He was um, translating um, Italian work in, in English and going back and forth as he was living there for a while. Uh, he had become homesick or so after a decade. He came back uh, and he was thinking about what home was. And then he felt like home isn't a place where you live. Usually maybe it's a terrain. He lives in Canada, but he grew up in New Hampshire. So what he referred to home for him was his range from point A to point B. And he wanted to walk his range. So he came through Canton and, uh, and, and Lynn Casserly, the Canton historian who uh, I've, I've become friendly with over the years. She said, you need to meet you know, Anders. His name is Anders Morley. He's a fantastic human being, fascinated as can be, and you gotta do this interview with him. And I sat down and we talked about it. We talked about the idea of home. And again, thinking about this character, Larry, who uh, is going to be uh, really jumping all over the place in his life, uh, in existence, uh, quite frankly, in the galaxy, at certain points, things start happening with him. It's like the first time I've ever played with the idea of science fiction and probably the last, but it was something, I, I love Kurt Vonnegut, I've read a lot of Vonnegut, and uh, I think maybe that's where that came from. But this little prologue was inspired by this conversation with Anders, and is right now just this little bit for the beginning of the story. Home isn't a point on a map, a place where I was born or where I've spent the better part of my life. Home is not quite where I live now, nor is it the place I may retire. I cannot describe what I know as home because I have never seen it with my own two eyes. The only home I've ever known is a place I visit in my dreams. This place I cannot describe. It fades from memory almost as quick as I wake, but I know it. It's a home I've returned to in subsequent dreams. Home, that feeling you get when you see it, the comfort, the feeling of a void you've never known you had until it has been filled. Home, it's otherworldly, but you know no other world. It cannot be described because it is in you. It is you, and then you wake. So it was short, just the idea, it's like in kind of a dreamscape -y kind of thing. Um, That's beautiful. Yeah, um, I will. I got a couple of. What do we got for time? It's always my concern. Is what do we have for time? Yeah, you know, I, I never want to interrupt. Oh no, um, you're good. You can. Right, I'd love for you to share some of your newer work too. Some more. So work. this is. Um, I was falling uh, talking about words and language, and um, 
I was, uh, was falling asleep and a lot of the times when you fall asleep, uh, you know, your mind sometimes is always racing. Whether you're worrying about what you're going to be doing for work the next day, um, in, in you know, my line of work, there are times where I'm going to bed going, I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. And my editor is probably going to kick me in the ass. Um, and if he's watching, he's going to appreciate that. Uh, but, uh, you know, and then you're just kind of like, you're winging it. You know, sometimes things fall on your lap, but your mind is always racing. Uh, and then there are the times where I'm thinking about not just work, but I'm thinking about fiction or I'm thinking about just words in general. And as I go play like a world room, uh, the idea of play on words. Uh, and so the title of this piece is, uh, is called Verjection, uh, which is just kind of a combination of uh, <laughs> verb, adjective, and noun, and just kind of like throwing the idea of all these, these things together, just throwing like, just playing around with words and seeing what you could do, making up your own words. Um, and so this is sort of like, as you're feeling when you're falling off, some of the things that you could possibly feel. This is what I was feeling, just falling off to sleep. Rejection guides me through the night, finds the words to explain how my heart throbs in my ear as darkness closes in. When the gentle buzz of life fades out, like gentle drowning, I'm sealed in. And I wander through the cavern, great gently drifting through the pillars, reflecting light on water, where are you from? And the echoes of a deep exhale. So like short, I was lying in bed, it happened. I grabbed it, I was like, I need to write stuff down. And uh, a lot of this stuff, like the piece that I read um, from when I was in the park, uh, it's like, just this is just all really raw, especially the new stuff I just decided. And that was part of it. It's like, this is stuff that just comes to my head and I write it down. And some of the things like, the, the piece on uh, Larry was, uh, was edited several times. Uh, it's probably not done. I might edit it a second or third time. I mean, I, I am constantly editing until someone has to tear it away from me. Uh, there was, and when we talk about a play on words and, and dreams uh, and inspiration, there is, and I have this on an iPad. So I'm looking, going from the Luddite papers. I have a typewriter that I usually work on and things like that that I love, but um, this piece uh, was inspired on so many different things and so many different levels and all of it um, hyper, hyper local. This goes back to, I'll, I'll finish, I'll, I'll, this will be the finish. I was saying, I mean, it, unless you don't, if you don't want, I can read more. Yeah, no, you're, you're, this is so great. I have a I lot. I love your writing. I haven't, you, you know, we talked about this before you got, came on. I haven't heard any of this stuff. I don't know your work well enough and I'm so glad to hear it. But I also really want to talk about Claude and Ola more and, and some of that inspiration, that inspiration. So read this, then maybe one more after about Claude and Ola. Well, this is, well, this is, this is Claude and Ola. I, oh, okay. I, 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 look, I, I Perfect. love them. This is like, they're, they, they have, you know, I know they're watching it and I, I hope, and I'm looking at you, if you're there, blush, Ola, <laughs> blush. <laughs> um, but but I, I, I love them. Claude's just, I know he's, you know, I love these people. So they've become sort of an op adopted family. Like the moment we met and we got along and just I fed off of their energy. I mean, these, you know, you look throughout the course of your life, I think that you, um, you meet people uh, and they come and go. And then there are the people that are just your people, your tribe kind of thing. Uh, you know, I did not plan to be here. I, I have been living here for seven years now. It was seven years just at the beginning of this month. Uh, I planned on probably coming here, working for a couple of years, picking up and picking up a gig somewhere else and traveling around. Circumstances being what they are, they land you here, you meet people, you fall in love with people, you fall in love with a place. Um, and then there are the people that it's, you know, that you just feel like, I don't, you know, we've never met before, but you are definitely family kind of thing. And I've always I've felt that way. We've not known each other even a year, but we've spent holidays together. We've traveled together, you know, so it's, you know, there's always been this closeness that I've felt to them. And, and, uh, and, and I like to think that it's reciprocated, right? Um, I bet, gonna, I bet it is. From what uh, I've heard. Not going to be so arrogant to assume, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, well, well yeah, so. I'd love for you to read this and then talk about um, what's it called, Roust? Or what? Well, this is actually Roust. Okay, okay. Roust was yeah. a two-part so thing. Roust tell was, us about that. I'll show you. This is I, I framed it because we were all so proud of it. Can you see that? 
So this was put together, that, that right there, was put together, uh, the, the artwork by, um, by our friend Nolan, who owns Auto's Abode in Wanakina, which if you've never been there, go. It's fantastic. It is a magnificent um, amalgamation of general store, like Mountain General Store and New York City Gallery. I mean, it is, and, and when he went there and I did a whole story about him, uh, he meant to make it a white wall gallery for art. And uh, he said, well, the general store pushed the white wall, wall gallery out. Uh, he does have one wall for art to be hung on with track lighting. All his work has been uh, shown there. So after we did the Chautauqua last year, uh, I said, look, we need to do more of this. This needs to happen here. I don't know why we're not seeing more, but we need to have more of this experimental music. It doesn't have to be, you know, just, you know, droning and, you know, chaos. I mean, but you know, getting together and improvising with musicians and playing together and creating things on the spot, being in the, in the moment, uh, feeding off of the energies of other artists. And so we, uh, you know, we talked about it. They went on vacation and tried to get away. It doesn't work because I had their email. So I bothered them during their whole trip to Cape Cod. I, I apologize, guys. I, I love you. Your patience is fantastic. Um, but as soon as they got back, they said, you know, you need to come with us and meet Nolan. And, and we, so we went to Wanakina. We went out, we ate, we hung out, and we talked about what we wanted to do. Um, the piece that I'm going to read is called Child Dreams. Uh, when I met Claude and Ola, they had told me they had a child. And I was like, well, you know, I need to meet your child because you people are magnificent. I can't even imagine what your, you know, what your offspring is gonna be like. And so every time we were supposed to get together, um, She's like, oh, Lydia's going to come along and, you know, we're going to, and then it didn't happen. And then another time, well, she'll be up and it didn't happen. And so we were going to go to Wanakina together and they show up. Well, she didn't want to go. I go, I'm beginning to believe you don't have a child. I, I'm thinking that this is all, you know, you're just pulling my leg. And uh, Ola's like, no, look, and she had her phone and she went to hold it up and she hit a button and it was Claude, Ola and the volume square in front of their child's face. I'm like, you know, I really, so we laughed about it. And I says, no, you know, uh, I'm convinced, uh, I'm convinced that you have a child. I says, but I, I think the reason she's not here is because she's sleeping somewhere and she's dreaming our existence. Like we only exist as a part of her dream. And when your child wakes up, we're gonna be gone and this will all be, you know, nothing. And so as we were working on this project, which I will talk about as soon as I'm done reading this, uh, we were coming up with names for it. And, uh, you know, first we thought we'd name it sort of like you know, about their, you know, a little bit after their daughter dreams. Uh, and then I said, well, what if we call it child dreams? And, you know, we ended up coming upon Roust, uh, which was a play on joust because we're all working off of each other, like jousting each other musically. But, you know, we, instead of like making it seem combative, like get up roust about like rousting and getting people's spirits going and kind of like in, on the spot. So that's where this sort of came from. Uh, and I thank uh, my my favoriteists, uh, you know, you know, after Claude and Ola, musician friend who I cannot wait to see. He is absolutely brilliant, uh, and you know him, uh, Dean Thornton. Dean I do. is. He's one of I, our best friends. He's wonderful. I, I, you know, I probably would annoy Dean with the amount of love that I want to give that man. He's fantastic. Uh, and, and so, and so, and I'll talk about our relationship musically and where we want it to go and all. Um, so Dean came up with Roust. And so uh, I said, well, I didn't want to let this child dreams go. I wanted to hang on to this. I thought this is a good idea. I like the concept. Uh, and so I started to write it. Um, and, and actually, you know, we had ideas of how we were going to do it. Um, and how we're going to perform it, but the initial piece, and then I'll talk about how it performed, uh, was was first written with um, with a gender to it, like talking about the child, and 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 I want this to be something that it can be um, all inclusive. I didn't want it to be where if you read it and you know you say it's like oh well it's a little girl so it leaves out little boys or if it's a little boy it leaves out little girls there's no race there's no color there's no creed it's just a child and frankly that could be that could be you if you feel like a child it doesn't have to be you know a four-year-old or a seven-year-old it, it could be a 44-year-old who thinks he's a seven-year-old guilty uh, but so this is child dreams based off of the fact that um, Claude and Ola's child is dreaming everything that uh, that we are and when she wakes up we're in trouble. 
There was a child who had stars in her shoes. Child had mud in her sleeves. In, oh, in its sleeves. I'm gonna start that again because I unintentionally engendered it. There was a child who had stars in its shoes. Child had mud in its sleeves. In child's eyes, there were galaxies and cosmic dust on its breath. Child was life. Child had a dream and a dream that was wilder than anything we could know because that dream was we. Child woke and we were gone, but not lost. What remained were the fading memories of ch that child inked on a page. This was child's dream. Their poetry is beautiful. Their words were fractured, linear, lyrical, template, a destruction of their truth. Quote, silence, violet wind, and dream about a chance to swim in clouds, to fall with leaves in scorching asphalt love, close quote. They kept them in a binder, but blinder than a bat. The metaphor is better for a madman in a hat. Quote, under chandeliers in halls so grand, a voice will carry far. Inside my head, behind a wall, your ambience escapes me. Hamble damble, rilkin sleeve, a mystic mathman reeling. Science stealing fragments, stagnant crystal eyes like psalms there in my pocket. Child's words just poured onto the page, consuming space like a vacuum of sound. Child was like its words, fluid, breath, palpable, a soothing swirl of living words in a time of madness. Quote, come see the space, come eat the air, come share upon a kinship. Your sister, brother, find trees and climb, grow tall among the grasses." Close quote. Child's madness was peace, which flew it inward, upon the back of a dragonfly, into a dream with tattooed serilities. Child shook and child rattled, child roiled and child rolled. Through the lines and the shading, the ink and the wire, drilling child on an awake acrylic amalgamation of history, of country, of culture, of love. So that was child's dreams. And mm -hmm. um, the the quotes, so when so I wrote it and then I rewrote it and then I changed it and did all the changing with the genders and things like that. And um, I actually, we were hoping because it was the, when we did Rouse and we put it on, we're like, well, we need to perform this and how do we do it? So uh, when we first organized it, the idea was we were just going to get a collection of um, artists. And I say artists because it doesn't necessarily have to be musicians. Um, it, you know, it could be, you know, uh, going back to Sean O'Brien who put on the Chautauqua. Sean is, is, I don't know if you've ever heard Sean do storytelling it's brilliant. It's I mean, like, it's really like he did, he did, he got on stage and he was telling a story. And by the time it was done, it was, it was talking about, uh, well, talking about how, you know, his wife, Lenore, and it was beautiful. And well, I mean, Lenore is a beautiful human being too. So I'm mean, like, who can blame him, right? You know, talk beautifully about beautiful people. And uh, so he was up on the stage and he was talking and doing this story. And he got incredibly like, I was waiting for him to start crying. And then when it was done, he was like, Thank you. I walked up and, and I mean, I was just, you were there with me. Like you, I mean, I wanted to start crying for him, but he was just, you know, telling the story and he's playing this part. And um, so we started telling him how we were putting together this roust, uh, this event. And, you know, and he said, you know, would you like to, you know, we asked him if he wanted to be a part of it. And he couldn't have been happier and uh, came down with, uh, did spoken word really. And so he had some things he prepared. And then I asked him because you know, like I, like I sang for a band and I, and I did it where it was, you know, sort of a rock band. We were all influenced by things like um, Tool and Faith No More. I'm a big Mike Patton fan. So like anything that you can do with your voice, do it, you know, like, and, and I do that now. I've gone to music where it's like soundscaping. So I still like, I will read some of these things. I create stuff like I've used my typewriter as an instrument. Uh, I use my voice on a loop pedal to create these kind of um, spaces that uh, make room to perform over or read over. Uh, so I took that aspect of what I do now and brought that to Roust. Claude and Ola did what Cla Claude and Ola do, which is, I mean, 
uh, everything from improvised beautiful classical piano over like the the clicks and 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 tweaks and electronic brilliance of you know the stuff that Claude does. I mean, he takes things like steel wool and contact mics and puts them together to come up with new sounds. I and mean, like what he does with sound, I can only hope to do with words. And so he, um, you know, they came down. Uh, we had uh, Sean doing spoken word and storytelling. Uh, Dean came down and played guitar and uh, and uh, did uh, sound sort of through guitar and with voice and uh, frankly we used our bodies at certain points just stomping on the ground and grunting and whatever you can whatever you were feeling really whatever it worked off of and it all seemed to work um, and then Jared Sommerfeld if you know Jared uh, and you know Graham Hoffman yes yeah so and Graham came down and he played uh, he played like fiddle that's such a fun team right there. <laughs> it really was. And, and, you know, Dean and I never played music before. I watched him uh, play with Claude and Ola during the Chautauqua two days after I had performed. And uh, it was, uh, I had never heard of it before, but it was so appropriately, he does doom folk. And I said, doom folk, what's this? Oh man, it was just fantastic. And, you know, his album, if you heard his album, uh, you know, I mean, uh, God, I wish I had a link to be able to get people to check out his stuff too. Yeah, uh, he was just posting stuff about that. I could, um, I could find it. Well, he's it doing a new here. project. It's a mm -hmm. new, like where it's like, you know, like throw in 30 bucks and you're going to get yep. this fantastic, like heavier duty record. And I'm like, you know, it's like, yeah. sign me up. I mean, yeah, we know. threw, we threw in for that. We're really excited. So, you know, um, and so none of and like, I only performed with Claude and Ola. Uh, and one time and improvised and read stuff and we didn't know where it was going. I was taking it to a different uh, avenue with what I was doing in this and we were all getting together for the first time. When Ola and I uh, really started like working on this uh, and what we wanted to do because the two of us in a room are like, I mean, I'm surprised the, fall, the walls don't fall down because we're like, yes, do this. Uh, and we get very excited about it. And, you know, and again, like artistically, even in ideas, we feed off of each other. And so she, um, she had this great idea of saying like, what if we had like color cards? I have a card, I mean, and you have a card. These are my, uh, my sisters are very clever. Happy birthday, Caroline, this is her 40th. And then the other one is Courtney. Uh, so they like say like, I have these in a bowl and here Maggie, I throw one down and you pick up one and yours says happy birthday, Caroline. And I pick one up, it says happy birthday, Caroline. All right, that means that you and I have to perform with each other right then on the spot. And whatever happens, there are no wrong sounds, as Alan Watts would say. Um, you know, this is just what's happening. Close your eyes and just accept it. And then if you allow yourself to do that, you know, your mind can do remarkable things. Uh, and maybe you can start coming up with weird stuff like this. So um, we wanted to fine tune it a little bit. We didn't want it to be just random in that way. So we um, set all of our stuff up and it was set up in the space and it's a small space. So, you know, I was here, Dean was directly across from me, but in between him and I, there were like, uh, you know, Lenore and Sean uh, and Sean's kids were there with Lenore and, you know, Sean was sitting next to me. And then over on the far side was Claude and Ola and Jared was on the floor and, you know, Graham was wandering around a little bit, uh, you know, playing from one side to another. So the sound for the audience who was sitting in between us, the sound is coming from all different angles. There's no wall of sound from a stage. It just comes from everywhere. And so we had it all set up. The audience was comfortable. It was a small audience, a very intimate, nice setting. And we went into the back and we all took little pieces of paper and wrote our names on it, crumpled it up and threw it on the table. And then we all took pieces of paper and wrote a number, one through seven. There were seven of us, crumpled it up and threw it on the table. And then we all picked a name and a number. So I picked Dean and number four and Ola picked Sean and number one. And so when we went out, we played maybe the first two minutes or so of the Alan Watts thing to just get the audience in this space where they should understand that just accept the sounds that are going to happen. It's not gonna be traditional music that you're used to, or you're not gonna be hearing, you know, a four, four, you know, verse chorus. This is just gonna be sound and you'll hear the music in it. And, you know, hopefully it'll allow your mind to do things that, it, you know, it wouldn't ordinarily do, uh, which is really what art should do anyway. It should challenge you. And, you know, this is why when people say, well, we want to write songs that are going to be great on the radio. Well, good luck. Uh, you know, I want to do something that's going to challenge people. Uh, it may not be good the first time I do it, but, you know, it's going to make you think about why it's not good. It's going to start a discussion, hopefully. Uh, and that's what it should do. So that little opening hopefully did that for the audience. And then Ola and I did a little kind of a segue between that 
and as I lowered the volume with that, and we did a little vocal segue that kind of mocked the chant that was in the back of the lecture. And then she started to play piano and Sean started with this, his first story. And the two of them would go for about 10 minutes. And before they were concluded, whoever had to go the second round, in this case, it was Claude and Jared, they would join in. So there was no stopping of the music. They would just combine and then Claude, I assume then Ola and Sean would drop out. And Jared and, uh, and Claude would go for maybe 10 minutes. And then all of us started to come in and all seven of us were performing together. And what was great about that, especially I feel for myself and in my experience, and then Dean and I shared in this experience was everybody dropped out and the, the, the heavier distortion, this kind of feedback sound that was still lingering came from Dean. And then I had my vocal stuff that I was doing with like a loop pedal and just playing with like these reverbs and just creating these soundscapes that he was able to perform over. And they were both, and we just fed off of each other. And it was the first time we ever played together. I mean, he'd never seen anything I'd done. Uh, I'd only seen him, you know, perform songs. And then of course, with, you know, the interlude of like feedback where you like, uh, I'm a big sonic youth guy, you know, and I love that play on, you know, sound and feedback. So, you know, and it continued like that until all seven pairs have played and it went through seamlessly until it concluded. We, uh, we took a break, we went in the back um, and I had given Sean, I asked him to read Child Dreams. So our second set was performing Child Dreams and uh, I kind of semi-conducted it uh, again because it was just really like loosely thrown out. We did it on the spot. Uh, I went in the back and if you heard when I was reading it, I was reading quotes. I could quote something and say like under chandeliers and hall so grand a voice will carry far, close quote. That one quote I took and I would write down like each every quote I wrote down on an index card and wrote a number on the back of the index card. And then I handed those index cards out at random to audience members. And so Sean, I told him, you just watch me. Ola had written a piano, like an overture for it, and then a piece that would kind of flow with it that she could improvise off of and that everybody else could improvise off of. And Sean would begin reading. And I was sitting there and I was like, okay, give me more of that. I'd ask him to stop. And I had a bell that happened to be located next to where I was at the register you know, as I was set up in the general store. And so I told each and every one of the, the people that I gave a, a card to, you're number one, listen for the bell. When you hear the bell, read the quote. Can you read it okay? Is my penmanship horrible? You can read it great. Read, read the quote and read it however you want. Uh, there's no wrong way to read it like there's no wrong sound. Whatever you're feeling at the moment, if you want to scream it, scream it. If you want to sing it, sing it. Uh, Graham's wife, Eloise, she, she's French. I said, read it in French. She did. Sean's son, who is a magnificent young thespian in uh, grade school, uh, you know, I gave, he was like, I want to give me, I was like, it's yours, take it. You know, he got out there, he's reading it and he's getting very, bell and he read the, uh, the quote uh, that had some random uh, made up words, like anything, like you'd see some of the, the wordplay in this was nonsense, but most of what we have in our dreams sometimes translates to nonsense. Uh, it makes it fun and it makes it feel like, you know, you're, it's much freer to just say these things, right? And so he was perfect for that. And so we did this where I would like, okay, I would stop Sean, I'd ring the bell, someone would read, and I'd bring Sean back in. Then I have him and I'd tell Ola, give me more of this. And it was just kind of like what we wanted more of. And then I just kind of like go and people, and so it was, a, you know, and some people didn't look up at all and just went. Dean was so in the moment and I loved it that his head was down and he was just going. And I said, like, there's no, there's no conducting him. Let him go. You can't conduct the wild. And, uh, and, and it's another reason I love him so much. <laughs> oh God. I can only so, it went off without a hitch, I felt like. We, we all felt like it was incredibly successful. Um, you know, we were all really happy with it. Uh, you know, and, and now we're just, you know, I think that we had, a, I think of it like, um, have you listened to John Zorn? Are you familiar with John Zorn? An avant musician, uh, composer, been doing it since forever uh, in New York City. And he does a lot of experimental music and he pulls together ensembles and he has some musicians that are core musicians and then some that bounce in and out. Uh, and I thought about Roust as sort of like, we did Roust and the next time we do it will be Roust volume two. And we will have, uh, you know, I always like to think that, you know, I'll be involved in some way um, because I've been wanting this. I don't have to be, and that's fine. I like to sometimes watch other people do their thing and watch it from the outside. Claude and I talked about this. I'd love it to be me, Claude, Ola, and Dean as like the core four and then bring in other artists. And it doesn't necessarily have to be musicians. 
It could be painters, people who want to like do work while we're performing and how it's inspired by the music they're listening to. Uh, you know, I, this stuff that I'm writing has been inspired by the music that I've listened to, uh, you know, from Claude and Ola, which I, I wanted the disclaimer that, you know, on this, it said that we were going to listen to some of their music and I was going to read something that I had written to some of their music. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the, the, the Zoom technology, the way it's worked, it, and I tried to check it, it came out a little distorted. I would love to be able to do something where hopefully is a point we can do it together live. Um, you know, they have an album that, you know, through the link, people can check out on Bandcamp. Uh, it is beautiful. It is not long. I have it on cassette tape, which, you know, I'm like, yes, right? Come on. How? What? <laughs> because that's how they released it. I love that, you know, so you can get it digitally, but I'm like, and my car, which fell apart, I came across a new car for real cheap and it has a tape deck in it. I couldn't think of a better time. I listen to it all the time. That's so awesome. you know, I, I want to try to, you know, and I mean, I'm really excited and I hope that the, uh, you know, the, the North country, you know, arts, you know, the, 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 if that center came the to the art first, center, yes, it would really mean, I think, uh, a lot to that community, uh, to the people who are looking for an outlet. Uh, you know, we, uh, you know, I have entertained the idea of finding a way where, um, you know, Dean and I, or if we can get Claude and Ola, you know, do like a social distance, like where we can be in a space away from each other and set up and just do similar to what we a smaller version of Roust. Um, you know, so there are projects that we want to do more of these. It's just, you know, there's not a lot of locations where this kind of thing would be considered, I think, welcome. Uh, and I think it's because people haven't really had the exposure. Uh, people talk about, well, they're not into it. I, just, I don't think people are, aren't into it. I think that you need to expose people to things. And once they grow accustomed to it, uh, they become to maybe appreciate it or be aware of it, uh, willing to explore it and willing to spend time around it. And so if we have a place where people can come in and experiment musically or otherwise, uh, you know, free of judgment and people can come in to watch it because they know what they're getting is just that. Uh, I think that would probably open up the community in general to a larger, uh, more uh, comfortable creative space. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I'm so excited about the Art Center and I'm so glad that I've been able to talk to you about it. Um, we definitely yeah. want to create that space where people can can experience art or make art or whatever that looks like. And, um, you know, I really love how multidisciplinary you are with your with everything that you do. And um, so I really appreciate you sharing all of this with us today. Um, we're yeah, like way. You. Sorry. Oh, so I was joking with you beforehand, right? Saying oh, yeah. that, like, you know, like my whole life is basic alchemy. Like I worked <laughs> as a chef on and off for 18 years before I did this. But it's like in a kitchen, there were no ingredients. You're just kind of like kind of working with, and I still do that in my own kitchen. You know, same thing with words, with music, um, you know, drawing, any of the art that I do. I think that, you know, if, excuse me, if people allow themselves to just do it without, you know, judgment of it and just opening themselves up to it, um, you become, I think, less vulnerable and you feel less or a bit more comfortable, I think. Yeah. Well, you know what? You have already inspired people today. I see in the comments people saying, I'm going to go write something now. <laughs> I've never done it before, but I'm going to go do it. So thank you so much for sharing this. This has been so wonderful, so much fun to, to get to know your work a little more. Um, this has been Art for Art's Sake with William Eckert. See you. And with Maggie McKenna. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye.